cast all my cares upon you, and I lay all of my burdens down at your feet, and any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares. I will cast all my cares upon you. Good morning and welcome to the Sunday morning service at Oasis. It's great to have you joining us this morning, and we hope that you will get in the comments below this video and let us know that you're watching if you'd like, and say hello and good morning to one another as well. We have Eric back again finally this week, and we also have a guest musician leading us in worship today. But before we get into that, we do have some announcements. Let's get into those, and then we will continue on in worship. Our next food pantry share will be held on Saturday, August 8th. It will be from 10.30 a.m. to 11.45 a.m. We ask that anyone who comes please wear a mask and stay six feet apart from any others who may be present as well. If anyone has an urgent need for food before our next food share, please feel free to reach out to us through our Facebook page or through our website. We would love to help out in any way that we can. For our members who contribute to the church to help keep it and all of our ministries, like our food pantry, running on a regular basis, we do have two digital options for you to continue to be able to give during this time. The first option is you can go to our website, oasisconwaygardens.org, and you'll click on the Give tab. Under that, there will be a tab that says Give Online. The other option is you can actually text the word Give with the amount, for example, give 20 if you wanted to give $20, and that will be sent to the number on the screen. That's 407-338-3885. If you would rather send a check, you can address the check to Oasis at Conway Gardens and either drop it off in our secured mailbox on our property or send it to us through the mail. You can find our address on our website and our Facebook page. As always, I just want to remind you guys to stay connected with us through social media. Especially during this time, it's crucial if you want to stay updated on all things Oasis to follow us through our Facebook page, through our website, through our YouTube channel. Our Facebook page is Oasis at Conway Gardens, and our website is oasisconwaygardens.org. On both of those, we will be posting regular updates as we begin to get to a point where we can finally reopen our doors again and what the safety of that will look like. If you want to check out past, present sermon videos, you can see those as well on all three social media accounts, the Facebook page, the website, and our YouTube channel. Thank you again for joining us for our online service today. As I said, our pastor Eric is back this week, and we are starting a new sermon series where we'll be studying further the books of First and 2 Corinthians in the New Testament of the Bible. We also have a guest worship leader for today. She is the worship leader at her church and is filling in for us this week as Glenn has been gone on vacation. And I'm a little bit biased because she's also my sister. So we hope you enjoy the special music today. We hope you enjoy this new series, Studying the Bible, and we hope you join us again next week. Morning, church. I'm Eric Lowermilk, interim pastor here at Oasis at Conway Gardens in Orlando, Florida. Today's scripture reading is going to be from Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. Turn there with me. Acts, it's after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and New Testament, chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. While you're turning there, I want to thank the church for my time away. I have taken the month of July off. In fact, I'm pre-recording this during some of that time. Uh, I am a professor by trade in my calendar year. My, my real work year begins in August, so it's really gracious 
the church for giving this time to refresh and renew. Let's go to Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. If you can hear the noise, that's my grandkids upstairs, but that's fine. We'll get through it just fine. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ the Messiah was Jesus. And when they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments. And he said to them, your blood be on your own hands. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. That's important. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justin, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God. A year and a half. Verse 12. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if this were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of question about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all grabbed Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. May God bless the reading of his word.
Welcome again to Oasis at Conway Gardens. I'm Eric Loudermilk, intern pastor here at the church in Orlando, Florida. As I said earlier, I am a professor by trade. And uh, before the pandemic, I did a lot more teaching in the church than preaching. There is a difference. Preaching usually has to do with the, the proclamation of the core message that Jesus is the Messiah or the proclamation of something in Scripture. Teaching has more to do with breaking things down in parts, almost lost something off the table there, and uh, explaining it more. And I am more of a teacher. Today's message is going to be a little bit of both. The first half of the message will be preaching what we've been saying over and over in the book of Acts. That there is opposition to the story of Jesus in the book of Acts. That's why we titled the series Message Unstoppable. Threats to the message and messengers. I'll be preaching that in the first half. But then we're going to teach a little bit in the second half and prepare us for our upcoming series on the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Two letters to the church at Corinth. Why am I doing it this way? Well, in Acts chapter 18, the story happens in Corinth. And so as we've been going through the book of Acts, sometimes we stop and address a New Testament letter that was written to the church that comes up in that part of the story. So we're going to have a short message on Acts 18, 1 through 17, about these threats to the message and how God overcomes them. And then I'm going to give you a little introduction to our series on the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Let's get started. So, what's going on in Acts 18, verses 1 through 17? Well, if you've heard any of the other messages on the book of Acts, we've got problems. You ever hear someone say, I want to get back to that New Testament church, to that old-time gospel? Sometimes we sort of have this unspoken assumption that everything was perfect and great in those days. But a very close reading of Scripture shows there's trouble, always. One of the uh, sp sprays, uh, commercial sprays that you buy to make your house smell get better, We're probably not supposed to say the name of it for some advertising purposes. But on the commercials, uh, they say, have you ever gone nose blind? You know, you smell this much, your neighbors smell dirty socks in the house. Well, sometimes I think we become text blind to Scripture, especially those who've been raised reading the Scripture. If you've not been raised reading the Scriptures, you actually kind of have an advantage here in that you could read it fresh for the first time and see what's really going on. For those who have read it many times, I want you to read it closely and see three obstacles, three hindrances in the church in the message of Jesus going out, and what happened as the church pushed on through those. The first of these is in the first verse or two of Acts 18. Read with me. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. They turn out to be of the same trade as Paul, and so he ends up staying with them, and as a result, Aquila and Priscilla become joint ministers with Paul, and the message goes to Corinth, and the message goes to Ephesus. Now think a minute, if you are Priscilla and Aquila, living in Rome, uh, being kicked out of town by the governor of the territory, or excuse me, this is the emperor, that would be an obstacle. At least my wife would think it would be an obstacle. Now let me tell you a little bit about this. We believe this happened in AD 49 under the emperor Claudius. It affects Christians because here, 19 years after the resurrection of Jesus, the church is still primarily Jewish. And so when something happens against Jews, it affects Christians as well. So really the Jews and Christians were expelled from Rome. The church in Rome was probably started from Jews visiting uh, Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost, they go home, they tell the story to their friends, and the church is born. So a, probably all the leadership of the church in Rome is kicked out of the city of Rome. This is a hindrance. This is an obstacle. Now, if you remember from earlier uh, messages on the book of Acts, what are the three things we said that the church does to overcome these obstacles? Remember them? Number one, 
they stay unified. Number two, they keep praying. They stay in prayer. And number three, as a result of these things, the Holy Spirit fills them and empowers them for message. They stay unified. In the last message on Acts, we noted that Paul and Silas weren't arguing in jail. This is another fine mess you've got me in, Paul. We don't hear that of Silas. He stays unified. They keep praying. They're actually worshiping and praising that night when the earthquake happens and frees their bonds. And three, as a result, the Holy Spirit fills them and moves. Now, in chapter 18, we don't see explicit reference to these, these three uh, steps for overcoming the hindrances. But they've been happening all through uh, the book of Acts. So what we do see in chapter 18 is the result of the Holy Spirit getting the church through this. So Aquila and Priscilla are kicked out of Rome, and as a result, they become joint ministers with Paul. Joint ministers with Paul, and they work in Corinth, they work in Ephesus, and we find out later they actually help Apollos, another teacher, become a better teacher of the story of Jesus. Okay, hindrance number two is in verse six. Let's go back to our scripture and look at there. Read with me, verse six. And when they opposed and reviled him, who were they? Well, if we look back in verse five, it's the Jews in the synagogue. When they opposed and reviled Paul, he shakes out his garments, meaning I'm done with you, and says to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So we have opposition. This has happened in several other cities on Paul's missionary journeys, Thessalonica, Berea, other places. What's the result? Paul goes to the Gentiles. Um, look at verse 8. As a result, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with his entire household. The second half of verse 8. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So here we have another challenge. He's kicked out of his place. Can you imagine being kicked out of your church? The great Jonathan Edwards was kicked out of his church. We remember him in church history for that. But he encountered opposition. Jesus encountered opposition. And here Paul's encountering opposition, but he doesn't give up. He just goes to the house of another person. And as a result, many people come to Jesus. Now, in addition to the three ways the church overcame these oppositions, unity, prayer, and being filled by the Spirit, there's three things I want you to learn as a result of seeing them in this chapter. Number one, opposition is normal. Those who attend Oasis regularly should be sick of hearing this and figuring this out by now. Because from the first chapters of, of Acts, uh, even to the point where all 11, well, 12 with the new disciple, all 12 apostles, are imprisoned, you'd think the church was shut down then, to earthquakes and people being demon-possessed and opposing Paul, to Herod killing James and trying to kill Peter and himself killed instead. Opposition to the church are normal. Problems are normal in church. Don't look for it to be perfect. Number two, the results of these oppositions are often that many people hear the gospel. Many people hear the gospel. And thirdly, I want you to remember that the church gets through also by just continuing to tick on. Don't look for some huge change. Sometimes these are changes little by little. And often I give the example in our leadership meetings of a flywheel on a car. Jim Collins, the author of the book From Good to Great, also wrote in his book, Good to Great for Nonprofits, that the most successful leaders of nonprofits get there because they keep making small changes and they don't stop. And on a vehicle, a little bitty gear in a starter changes this huge gear of the flywheel. Tick, 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 just keeps it up. And eventually the motor catches and then the motor carries itself. Well, Jim Collins learned that successful nonprofit CEOs never give up. They just keep ticking keep ticking. How much more for us Christians who can stay unified, who can pray together on a regular basis, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit as we push, we see these changes happen. And here, Paul's kicked out of the synagogue. What's the result? He gave up and went home? No. Many people believed. 
Now let's look at the third and final hindrance in this. This third hindrance comes a little bit later. Um, it's in verse 12. Let's turn there. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. In fact, Paul is teaching them to worship contrary to the law because a Roman citizen was obligated to worship the entire pantheon, and including worshiping Caesar. And Paul is proclaiming Jesus only. So he's kind of guilty of their charges. But does he suffer as a result of this? No, he actually doesn't. Verse 14. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, he's about to open his mouth, Gallio shuts them down. If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, old Jews, I would listen to you. But since this is a matter of uh, words and names and your own law, see it to yourself. I refuse to be a judge of these things. He won't even listen to the charge. Paul's probably guilty as charged. He is preaching against worship in Caesar. He is preaching against worship in the Pantheon. But he gets off scot free. And to make it even more interesting, it says, verse 17, and they seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him. They didn't beat Paul. They beat Sosthenes. That makes no logical sense if you were standing there. Why are you beating him? Except that the Holy Spirit is protecting Paul. In fact, a few verses earlier, in verse 9, the Lord spoke to Paul. He appeared to him in the night and said, go on preaching. I'm not going to let anyone harm you. Paul and his team are filled with the Spirit of God, and they continue. So that's the third hindrance. Isn't it amazing, as we continue to read the book of Acts, that that theme happens over and again? We saw in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that Jesus said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And the end of Acts, Acts chapter 28, the last verse says, And the gospel went out unhindered. In other words, it's the same word for hindrances that we're reading here. This word actually occurs in the book of Acts, but now it's negated. And that's really the plot. Jesus says they're going to be witnesses, but right off the bat, they, incur, they encounter obstacle. And over and again, the Holy Spirit gets them through. Church, believer, don't think it's strange when obstacles come into your life. Don't think it's strange when obstacles hit your church. They are normal. That is normal. We get through them by uni unity, staying unified, not bickering over small things, praying, praying privately, praying together, and then asking God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Let's keep ticking away, church. So for the second half of our message today, we're going to preparation for our series on first and second Corinthians. So what's going on in first and second Corinthians? Let me first start by saying this. I've often told students that I think two or three of the most relevant books of the Bible for today are Judges in the Old Testament and first and second Corinthians in the New Testament. Why would I say this? Well, the book of Judges in the Old Testament tells the story of the nation of Israel when, quote, there was no king in those days. In fact, in Judges 17, and again at the, at the end of the book of Judges, we hear the writer say, there was no king in those days, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And as you read the story, it's a complete mess. Even the best leaders leading Israel who even claim or try to follow God during that time, make huge messes of things. And yet, God gets them through that period in history. The letters of First and Second Corinthians are written to the church at Corinth, which in the first half of today's message, we heard that God planted a church there through the Apostle Paul. Well, Corinth was a clay, crazy place. And uh, we're going to find today um, in our little introduction that 
Corinth was not only a crazy place, but kind of a crazy church. There was a lot of mess going on in that church. And yet, God got the church through that. So these, this is why I'm doing this together, is the series on Corinthians reinforces the point in the first half of our message today on Acts 18, that there's always messages, uh, threats to the gospel. Secondly, and if I repeated this earlier uh, in a previous message, uh, forgive me, but you know the air freshener commercial where they say you've gone nose blind and you smell you th what you think is a fresh room, but your friends, when they visit, they smell sweaty socks and so forth. Well, I think we sort of go nose blind when it comes to scripture, but we go text blind, especially if you're used to uh, reading scripture in church your whole life. But if you've read scripture new for the first time, you'll be a little bit more situated to hear the text and listen clearly for what's going on. But if you're pretty well scriptured, I want you to listen closely as we go through this series on the problems that are going on in the church at Corinth. I have uh, some slides here that I want to show you as we just do this quick introduction to the letters of 1st and 2nd Corinthians. First, I want to show you here the location of Corinth. Uh, this picture comes from my Bible software. And I'm going to choose a pointer here and help you see. Now, down here off the screen is where Jerusalem is. So this is a zoomed in view. So Paul left Jerusalem, went to Antioch. Uh, well, actually, he left Antioch in Acts 13, and he did his missionary journeys way up here off the screen. On his second missionary journey, in this landmass that is Turkey today, he, he has a dream of a man from Macedonia. And so that man, through the Spirit, encourages Paul to come over to Greece or modern-day Europe. Then he encounters trouble in Thessalonica and Berea. And uh, in the month of June, before my time away, we studied Acts 17, where Paul is in Athens. And he does the famous sermon, uh, saying, I know this God that you have a statue to, an idol to, the unknown God. Well, here we are in Corinth now. And Corinth is important. It's a very wealthy city. It's a very diverse city, diverse ethnically and diverse uh, religiously. Why would I say that? What caused it to be diverse? Well, first off, we have a major trade route here that goes east-west, and you can't see it quite so well because the word Corinth is over it, but we have an isthmus, a slender piece of land that connects this uh, landmass here, Greece, where Athens is, with this landmass, Achaia, here. And it is six kilometers wide or about three miles wide. Plus, you have the Aegean Sea here and the Ionian Sea here. And sailors wanted to save this long trip here to the Ionian Sea. And so they went across this land mass uh, that's this isthmus, which is three miles long. How did they do that? Well, here's how they do it in modern times. Now, I want to give image credit here. And I got this image a few years back from a website called Athens dash taxi.org, which I can no longer find today. So I want to give proper image credit. This canal is six kilometers long and it was dug in the eighties and it saves ships that long visit. But actually ships got across the isthmus in biblical times. How did they do that? Well, of course, I'm glad you asked. On the ancient Dioclos, and that's what this is, but they did it over the land. And so how do they do that? <coughs> Excuse me. This is another picture from my Bible software. They did it on a, a rolling platform in which the ships were placed and this manual labor, perhaps slave labor, uh, pulled them across this six kilometer or three mile way. Wow, they really wanted to avoid that long journey around Achaia. Now think about it. These, the manual labor has to be supervised. Someone owns this rolling platform. They're probably taxing it, and that takes time to move them. And so uh, 
Corinth is a hotbed, a crossroads of two major trade routes, one by sea and one by land. And so that brings into Corinth goods, it brings in money, it brings in ethnic diversity, it brings in different belief systems. And so it's like our cities like Miami and New York, which are seaports and very diverse and very large. I think it's also like Orlando. Here's a Google Maps map of Orlando. And for those who are not from Orlando, right in the center here, we have uh, I-4, which this first red line is laying over, and the Florida Turnpike. Now, original Orlando and downtown is up in the right-hand corner, but the current hotbed of activity in Orlando is right here because we have Universal Studios and way down I-4, we have Disney and so forth. And we are a very diverse city. We have uh, things that happen in Orlando that bring the nation's eye and, and there are differences of belief and religious belief here. We had the Pulse shooting, which we're so sad about, but that has helped thrust Orlando into the forefront of LGBTQ issues, which often, of course, are opposed to scriptural teaching. So my point is, is that just like judges, First and Second Corinthians are very relevant uh, for Christians today. There is a lot to say here in these two books that help us understand stand and navigate the Christian life when we might be tempted to say, what's wrong with us? Why is it simpler? It, when in fact, we learned in Acts 18, the church was messy, and we're going to learn in First and Second Corinthians that the church is messy again. So let's go back to our slides here, and, and let me show you something else. Now here is a map of first century Corinth, uh, again from my Bible software Logos, and I want to tell you that, you know, sometimes we think back 2,000 years ago and we think old, primitive. But, you know, the Greco-Roman world was quite bustling and quite diverse. We have theaters over here on the right. We have a um, temple here. Uh, in Corinth, there is a temple to the goddess uh, uh, Aphrodite, which is the love goddess. And in the classical age, which is about three to 400 years before this, the temp this city boasted the bulging number of 1,000 temple prostitutes. Now there's still temple prostitutes in Paul's time. And in fact, Paul addresses this issue in his letter to the church. And he tells people, don't be sleeping with prostitutes. <laughs> um, we don't seem to have that much of a problem in our modern churches today. But I want you to see that Paul's encountering problems. Now, what, what, what role does a temple prostitute have? Well, we don't want to get too far into this, but the men of the city would go to the temple and, quote, unquote, worship. So, yes, the church is messy during that time. Uh, so this is a very diverse, uh, very happening city. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the letters themselves, and something that most of us, when we first start studying Corinthians, are unaware of. This is uh, several passages in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 7, 1, 7, 25, 8, 1, 12, 1, 16, 1. You see this repeated phrase, now concerning. Look at this first one here, and I'll go back to my pointer. Now concerning about the things which you wrote. You wrote. See, there's a letter before Paul's letter to them. In fact, if we turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, we actually see evidence of another letter. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, 9, in my first letter, I'm flipping back to it. I'm actually re-recording this message. The first one we had trouble in our first recording with the audio. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. But then he goes on to clarify and, and he says, I, I mean people who claim to follow Christ, 
I don't mean pull away from unbelievers. How else are they going to hear the gospel? But for right now, our point is Paul has written them before. Paul has written the Corinthians before, but we don't have that letter any longer. And so we believe this letter to be Paul's second letter to Corinthians, even though we call it 1 Corinthians. Verse 11 in chapter 5 sort of confirms this because he says, but now I am writing to you. In my first letter I wrote, but now I'm writing to you. So this is at least Paul's second letter. Now let's flip over to 2 Corinthians and go to chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. Now we know Paul's from Acts 18. We, we don't hear of any church discipline in the book of Acts in his time there. So we believe this to be a second visit after his first evangelistic visit. And scholars actually believe that this occurred uh, after Paul's letter that we call 1 Corinthians. So he has a visit in which he seems to carry out some of the church discipline that he refers to in 1 Corinthians. And we'll get to that later. Now, if you read on in 2 Corinthians 2, he refers to another letter. Uh, so let me begin in verse 1 again. Chapter 2, verse 1. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? Verse 3. And I wrote as I did, so that I, when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. Verse 4, for I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart with many tears. So he's referring to another letter here. And we don't have time in a Sunday morning sermon, and you guys don't want to be bored with all the college class details. But we actually believe there's another letter that we don't have which we refer to here as Paul's sorrowful letter uh, mentioned in chapter 2. In fact, there are some scholars who hold that Paul wrote five letters and told them we have two. But the actual number of letters is not what I'm trying to make clear to you. What I'm trying to make clear to you is, one, that there's more here than just our commands of how to behave. That if we read the text closely, we can gather details that will help us piece these commands together. You see, 1 Corinthians interacts with 2 Corinthians, especially as regards to things like church discipline and problems. And then that brings us to our 2 Corinthians, which we believe is the fourth letter. Now, things are actually a mess in Corinth. Paul is dealing with people who argue over which teacher they're loyal to. Some follow Paul, some follow Cephas, which is Peter's other name, and some follow Apollos, another teacher. Paul is also writing, dealing with some very inappropriate sexual relationships. Not only do we have his teaching to not continue to join themselves to prostitutes, but also he deals with a man who is sleeping with his father's mother. So we have church discipline dealt with here, and in 2 Corinthians, we see the role of grace in church discipline. He also addresses things like, you know, they're so prideful of all their spiritual gifts, but they're ignoring the poor in their communal meals. And then lastly, 1 Corinthians is really our anchor text for teaching on spiritual gifts, and we'll address that in our series as well. So things are a mess in Corinth, and uh, one of my colleagues provided this picture. <laughs> You know, like a dog has made a mess in the kitchen with a dog food. Paul is really trying to clean up a mess of corn. We humans are messy people. Jesus doesn't come to just fix all our problems and things are over. In fact, all of the New Testament letters, but two, are what we call occasioned or situational letters. All these letters, except for Ephesians and possibly Romans, Paul and Peter and James and the writer of Hebrews are addressing problems in the church. So just like our message, first half of our message today, I want you to know that unfortunately, 
problems in the Christian life and problems inside the church are no normal. You know that old uh, cliche, when you find the perfect church, don't jo join it because you'll ruin it. <laughs> and people say they quit going to church because of hypocrites. Well, unfortunately, that phrase indicates a lack of awareness of Scripture. The church has always had problems who wrestled to align their stated belief with their acted out belief. Paul says, you guys are calling yourself saints. You need to act like it. And what is Paul's response to all this? His response is, let's focus on Jesus and his crucifixion, his suffering death for us. So in the conclusion, sometimes Paul sounds like a biological father. Uh, sometimes he's loving on the Corinthian Christians like a newborn child. Other times he's about lost his mind. What am I going to do with you guys? And so it's through this series that we're going to see that the church takes care. It needs care and that there are different problems and there are different ways of handling these problems. But in the end, God is in control and these problems shouldn't uh, shake our faith. In fact, often in Acts, those problems are the very vehicles that lead to the gospel, the story of Jesus coming into more households and more people finding the forgiveness that's in Christ. I'm going to give you some homework this week. You've probably heard from uh, Stephanie by now that you can purchase the ESV, English Standard Version, scripture journals for First and Second Corinthians, and you can Read these books individually and keep notes on the side. You might choose to purchase that, or you may just use your good old Bible or a phone. I'd like you to be reading 1 Corinthians this week. Now, in a perfect world, I'd like you to read it more than once, but that may be feasible for some and not for others. And then as you read, again, hopefully rereading, turn off your nose blindness. Turn off that text blindness and read closely. See what's going on. Listen to the details. And then one last homework assignment. Ask yourself, who is Paul addressing? What does he call them? Are they Christians or non-Christians in Corinth that he's writing to? His specific recipients, what title or titles does he use for them? And that will be a key, somewhat of a shocking key, I believe, in understanding these two letters as we go forward. Have a good week. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh,